So um, my, my presentation is about empowerment and how I believe that blended learning really can facilitate empowerment in students. So the first question we want to ask when we're talking about empowerment is simply, what is empowerment and why is it so important? We know that's one of the themes of our conference uh, the past two days, student empowerment, but what is it? So I started doing some, some research into the topic of empowerment, and in fact, I found out that the most interesting work in empowerment has been done actually in the, the field of business management when they've done research on uh, employees and how to make employees more empowered in their job and as a result they're going to be more effective employees. So um, I want to tell you a brief story about an empowered employee and we'll draw some parallels to an empowered learner. I'm going to use the example of my sister, younger, much prettier sister, <laughs> who uh, she's a, a sales associate at um, Bloomingdale's department store in Beverly Hills in California. It's a high-end department store and she's responsible for selling uh, what she calls tabletop. In other words, the dishes, the, the crystal and everything that goes on on the table settings. So she gets customers coming into her store and, um, and they're looking for expensive place settings. It could be, say, uh, three or four or five thousand dollars for one place setting, they'll come in and say, I want eight, eight of those by a particular designer. And so it's a forty thousand dollar sale for her. So what she has learned over the time is that the most important thing is the customer and you have to satisfy the customer. So of course if she has that product in stock, she's going to sell it to them, everything will go fine. But more often than not, people are coming uh, asking for a particular designer product and it's not in stock. Well, the first thing she does is she will check the inventory for other stores in the area and if other, another store has it, fine. The customer can get it from that store. More often than not though, my sister ends up calling the, the New York importing office because most of the, uh, the fancy dinnerware comes, like Rosenthal from Germany and so on, uh, is imported. And um, then if the importer says, yeah, we can get it in for you right away, she'll do that and arrange for it to be sent by FedEx to the, the customer's home. But what's interesting also is that it may f find out that the, the importer, uh, the head office in New York cannot get that product. So what my sister will do, she'll speak to the customer and say, no, I'm very sorry we can't, we can't give it to you, sell it to you. But our competitor down the street, let's say Saks Fifth Avenue, has it and, and you can purchase it there. And in fact, I'll, I'll give you the product number and so on so it'll be easier when you go to that store. So she's lost the sale, but very importantly, she has not lost the customer. Because that customer is going to remember the service that she gave, in fact, and is going to come back. Uh, to her, to my sister, and probably bring her friends, refer her friends. So now when I started looking at the literature, it came uh, that some of the more interesting work was done earlier on. Thomas and Veldhaus uh, wrote a, a seminal paper on uh, employee empowerment. And they said really empowerment is not just engagement, uh, motivation, it's really composed of four separate factors that work together and when these factors work together, uh, employees, and we're going to draw the parallel to learners, are motivated. So first of all, the important part is flexibility. You have to, imply, uh, to uh, give the person performing the task, learners in our case, uh, flexibility and choice in what they do. Secondly, um, the, the person has to care about the task, it has to be meaningful, it has to be consistent with their values and beliefs, like my sister cared about satisfying the customer. And so as a result, uh, she felt customer satisfaction is the most important thing, and she's going to then do her best to satisfy that customer. Thirdly, she has to have the confidence, feel uh, the, the confidence that in fact she can uh, serve the customer so the employer has set it up so that she's they've given my sister the tools to be able to do the research and and make the inquiries for the on behalf of the customer and then finally um, she has to know that that what she does will make a difference and it will it will satisfy the customer so that's meaningful and that's what she wants to do 
Now, um, these four factors actually are, are very important and they have to come together. And I feel that blended learning is a mode of instruction that really can facilitate all four factors. Often we just think about the first, the flexibility offered by blended learning, but in fact it can support the other three factors as well. Now I want to show you an example of uh, a, a very uh, empowered student, a student that I taught uh, a year ago. As a student, I really like blended learning formats because it allows me to interact with the course material, the course content, my professor and my peers in a very different way compared to traditional courses. For example, I took Professor Ron Austin's blended learning course issues in digital technology and education last summer. And some of the advantages myself and my peers noticed was that we were able to get instant feedback either from our professor or from each other. Another advantage was that we were able to, to discuss course content and reading material online together, which was really nice because we were able to share our views on the reading, reading material and then create this kind of shared understanding of the content. A third advantage is that the blended learning course tends to be very flex flexible and tends to complement our work schedule, our home schedule, and our personal schedules, which are very, which is very nice. Another advantage is that a lot of our online discussions flowed nicely into our classroom discussions, which were great because we were able to further discuss a lot of our online discussions in the class, um, in, in the classroom even more. And lastly, one of my favorite components of the blended learning course is that it had both a, a virtual space where we can discuss um, the class and the course material. And it also still had the personal touch of interacting with our peers and professors, which I really liked. Um, I really like blended learning courses because it's very flexible, it's very accessible, and it allows you to interact with your peers and the material anytime from anywhere. Okay. So, uh, Crystal, wouldn't you all love to have students like that all the time? No, you don't always, but um, she makes some very important points, and I thought it'd be good for the student to present her, her point of view. She talks about the flexibility and how blended learning really suits her particular way of learning, how she learns best. So Crystal is more than simply an engaged student. She's an empowered student, and the difference is that an engaged student, probably it's the instructor who sort of pushes and tries to make the student engaged. Whereas an empowered student is pulled into the task. The task draws the student in so they, they take control of their own learning. And I think that's a very important distinction. That so it's the, the push versus the pull. We can push students to get engaged, but we cannot push students to get empowered. We have to create the conditions to pull them into that task, into learning, and, and make them engaged. Now, the question came up about what is blended learning, and I think I need to pause and, and take a look at it. We're encouraged to be interactive, uh, but the online interactive tool put out, uh, well, and we know the OEB uh, network is kind of slow, so I'm going to do the analog way. Multiple choice question for you, show of hands. What is the best example of blended learning? The course syllabus is online, instructor uses PowerPoint, classes meet less often, but there's online activities. All of the above or none of the above. So show of hands for A, who thinks that that is a blended course? Good, I'm glad to see no one. No one. <laughs> <laughs> How about uh, B, is that a blended course? Oh, good. What about C? Okay, yeah, I see quite a few. Uh, D, mm. and E. Okay, well, uh, I think the majority said C, and in fact, yeah, that's the, it, it's the substitution of, of online, uh, sorry, of face-to-face -face with online activities. The reduction of the the face-to-face -face contact and the substitution of the equivalent amount of time online. That's, that's the definition that is, is used, I think, most often, because there are other versions as well. There's, if, if you're looking at sort of like a, 
a small amount, like web, it's, it tends to, small amount of technology, it tends to be web facilitated. You might have a, a little online discussion group in your course. Well, that's really a, a web facilitated course. And I think it's very important for us to make these distinctions, but it's the, it's the hybrid or the blended version where there is a substitution. Now, the 30 to, to 79 percent, that's, that's very approximate. It's just a guideline, but it's a, it's a portion, a significant portion that is replacing the face-to-face. -face. And, of course, if it's more than that, it's, it's a fully online course. I don't think there's any discussion or argument there. But that, so that's the important thing for us to do, is to make the distinction and clarify what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, blended learning. Often faculty will add components to their course and create what we call a course and a half. They'll have the regular course and expect students to do more online. And that's really not what we want to encourage. But so there's now, still a challenge, isn't it? There's still a cha challenge of this, uh, the whole content behind that blended. What is it that can be done online okay. and what can be yeah. done or is sensible to do face to face? So it's all these decisions that we make when we create or design yeah. the course. Absolutely. There are decisions and there's no a standard answer to that. The idea mm -hmm. is what you're trying to do is take the best advantage of both the online and digital. So we know, uh, sorry, online and face-to-face. -face. We know in face-to-face -face it's easy to have spontaneous interaction the way we're doing. This probably would not work too well online. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but we know if we want thoughtful discussion and we want everyone to participate in a class this size, as this group here, we cannot have proper interactions, so therefore online will facilitate that. So depending on our goals, we will make different mixes. Uh, and that's important. There's no single rule saying, oh, you should have this online and that in face-to-face. -face. It's what, how you can take advantage of both environments best. Um, one of the things that, that, that blended learning really does, and it really encourages um, empower, student empowerment, it allows for flexibility. In, in students' schedules and, and allows them for a balance in sort of their study, work, and, and overall life experience, family commitments, and so on. We've done surveys of our own students and we found that probably about 40% of our students are working at least 25 hours a week. And it's surprising how many students, maybe about 10% of our students, are actually working full-time and studying full-time. <laughs> Full-time in terms of number of hours, they're working evenings into the night, perhaps early mornings before classes and so on. So, it's, so this, uh, it's, what it's doing, it's really freeing up students to, to, um, to have more of a life, to have their schedule, working around their schedule. Um, second of all, we found that satisfaction is very high. Some research I did at Canadian universities a while back and we're finding very high satisfaction levels, and this has been replicated in, in more recent studies as well. Student satisfaction, in fact, Eric's study was talking about student satisfaction, is, tends to be much higher in blended courses, and when students respond to surveys, if they take another blended course, they say, yes, indeed, I would want to do another blended course. So that, that's another um, a particular good point of it. Now, one of the things, um, we all talk about students wanting technology. So how much technology do you think students really want in their courses? Yeah, they're connected, they've got their, their smartphones and they've got their laptops. How much technology do students really want in courses? What would you think? Show of hands for A, about pretty well no technology in courses. How many, anyone agree with that? What about B, a moderate amount of technology? Okay, yeah, looks a good number of you agree there. A lot of technology, the students really want a lot of technology, and they have no preference. Okay, a few of you. Yeah, but in fact, I would agree with you that surveys are showing that the majority, they want moderate amounts of technology. Now, ECAR, the Educause Applied, uh, Center for Applied Research, has been doing surveys with Babson College in the U.S. about student uh, preferences. And for over 10 years, they're showing a very consistent trend. Students don't want all technology all the time. They want some technology, a moderate amount. There are some students, of course, who don't want any IT, any technology in their courses, and there's some who really only want fully, fully online courses, but most are in the middle. So you see, what, what we're finding here then is 
this blended learning is, is suiting learning uh, preferences of students, and it's, and it's giving them the, the, the confidence, the, the desire to want to learn more. Um, finally, the other question we asked previously was just, what about performance in blended courses? And in fact, uh, this is some research done by University of Central Florida, one of the leaders actually in blended learning and uh, pioneers. And they've been collecting data from their students for over 10 years. And now we're talking about a million students here actually, looking at their students. And um, we'll see that they found the success rate higher in blended courses using the definition that I talked about of the substitution definition. Next would be fully online, followed by face-to-face. -face. Uh, lecture capture would be just a standard course with lecture capture available for students to watch after, later. And blended lecture capture is less time face-to-face, -face, but lecture capture as well for students to follow. So um, they found this consistent pattern more recent, well, not more recent, but other studies that have looked at uh, uh, a meta-analysis studies of studies when they put the studies together. Barbara Means from SRA International has, has got a well often cited study a few years back about the US Department of Education when she found sort of a moderate effect when you put the studies together in favor of, of blended over face-to-face. -face. And sim similarly, um, uh, Bob Bernard at Concordia University and colleagues have done a lot of work on meta-analyses, putting studies together and looking at the results and are finding Again, similar results. So the literature is quite, quite clear now that students in blended classes are going to do better than fully online and then f and fully traditional face-to-face. -face. That literature is quite clear, and I know people are doing studies, but in some ways, I think what we need to do is move on, look at what kinds of combinations, say, of online, what kinds of activities we put online, which are more successful, rather than comparing simply to traditional formats. And in fact, we, I'm just working on a study now doing the analysis where we're comparing uh, students in like 30% online, uh, sort of around the 40, 45% online, and then 60% online, and, and looking at the differences both in terms of attitudes and learning outcomes. I think we need to move more in that direction rather than the comparison with with face to face. So in summary, yes, satisfaction is higher if you notice that as well in certainly blended courses. Really what we're doing here, I think we can empower students uh, through blended learning because of the flexibility that, uh, that it offers. Uh, it's consistent with really lear student uh, learner preferences in terms of how they're going to approach their learning and it can build confidence in terms of if, if students feel they can accomplish the task and also if students feel that they're going to succeed in the task, it really, they are going to be empowered. So the challenge I'm leaving with you is what can you do to empower students? So thank you very much and any questions if we have time, I'm not sure if we do. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you.